Awesome hearing Ben. He actually had some points that, uh, oh, I got to grab that too, um, that are part of what I mentioned. And I think that's that great, like KNF kind of understanding some of those basics there and going, yeah, why am I going to do it if, you know, work harder, sorry, work smarter, not harder. Uh, let the microbes do it. Anyways, we'll get into that. Microphone? Yep, I'm going to grab it. I'm just getting, uh, I know, I know. That's the unrecorded stuff. So we'll start with my slideshow here. We'll just start that. Yeah. Just kidding. I'm a farmer. I didn't I don't have time to do that. It's California. We're still growing things. So here's my slideshow, guys. This just keeps me on track. Anyway, so about me, I'm in the Sacramento area in California. Um, I grow for some chefs. I swore I'd never grow for chefs. Uh, it was always a pain in the butt when I farmed out here. And uh, yeah, but it's worked out really well. So Sacramento has decided to change its name from the city of trees to farm to fork capital, uh, which is kind of dumb, but it puts pressure on the chefs. And so they actually come find us now because they want to get local produce and things like that. Um, so we grow on about an acre. We've got more land. We kind of try to keep that wild. Um, it's pretty intensively planted not like a market garden system where it's like fast turnovers. I'm doing peppers from Mexico that are 120 plus days. I can do that in my climate, but I mean, it's, it's still a long, like you're not getting, they're not popping off right away. But anyway, so um, that's a little bit about what I do. Um, I love fermenting things. I should just keep on track because otherwise we'll just chit chat all day. Um, yeah, so kind of always been growing uh, plants since I was little. There's unfortunately probably naked pictures of me in the garden with a hose at like three, four years old. Um, kind of always been in plants. Like they just fascinated me. I love science. Like it never made sense to me why people didn't like science. Like I'm like, it's, it's all around us. Like we get to look at it. We get to play with it, touch it, eat it, all those good things. So growing up, we always had a garden. My grandma had like the greenest thumb ever. She'd pull a leaf off a tree and like grow a new tree. And I was like, this is amazing. Like, how do I do this? Um, ended up, you know, kind of by progression through where I uh, kind of got into farming was, you know, we gardened, we had stuff. It wasn't ever a thing. Um, it was just something we did. And then uh, happened to move back to well, got in that, like, that whole, like, oh, I'm going to do urban homesteading. And like, oh, those guys in Pasadena, man, they're making money because they're just a little their backyard. Like, that's fantastic. Uh, and realizing, like, ah, it's not really what I want to do. And then we, uh, I moved back to New Hampshire. Um, I know, New Hampshire. Uh, I, hate to, I just like to say New England because it's like, uh, out of all the states in New England, New Hampshire. But I uh, actually started my kind of organic vegetable farming career, like, where I'm getting paid for it. Um, it's not just a little fun project in the backyard or a hobby. Um, worked on a couple farms in New Hampshire, um, all organic, in title. Uh, that was an eye opener. We'll get into that. Um, did that for about three years. Figured, yeah, uh, this real winter stuff, not really into it. As you, sandals, I don't like shoes. I don't really like pants either, but. Um, Move back to California, every, well, so it was a weird thing. Moving to New Hampshire, everybody's like, you move to New Hampshire to farm, like with winter and rocks, and like, why would you do that? Tons of pests. You grew up in the Central Valley of California where we grow like 70% of the food. Why would you go there to just happenstance of life? And then when I moved back to California, it was like, wait, you're gonna start your own farm in like crazy expensive land and like there's no water and everything's burning down and wasn't quite burning down yet 10 years ago, but yeah, we've worked up to there. Um, started my own farm, leasing land, just kind of using what I could, doing it as cheap as possible. I was, I was determined because I saw too many farmers start young and uh, get into debt and then burn out in a couple years. And just like, oh, now I got all this debt and I have nothing to show for it. So I was pretty determined, still am. No debt, I'm not taking out all these things. I'm not paying for a tractor on a loan. I'm gonna, you know, we'll piecemeal it together. You could do it efficiently if I had the money, 
or you can take a lot of time and do it cheap. And so that's kind of been the progression of, you know, 10 years of getting paid to farm and grow vegetables for people was, oh, I had to take kind of a flip-flop approach. Um, I do have my six legal plants, uh, thanks to my, some of my KNF friends and Wendy giving me some seeds to start with. And uh, so I'm kind of the opposite of what Wendy is, where you started in cannabis and then kind of added some food crops to the farm. I have food crops and kind of added some cannabis to the farm. So it worked out well, it's nice, it fits in, it blends in, it, all that good stuff. Um, some of the cool things, uh, Dan Kittredge, who we'll hear tomorrow, uh, I heard him at a NOFA summer conference when I was farming back here. And that kind of started my journey down the road to KNF. I'll just briefly kind of how, how I got to where I got to currently and why I use those systems and why they've made sense for me. Um, Dan was talking about, I mean, I don't want to give his spiel. He'll talk about it tomorrow. Um, but nutrient dense foods and going like, hey, we don't, why are we so sick all the time? Why is this happening? Like, oh, maybe our food doesn't have the nutrients in it anymore because we've just decided like quick and easy is better. And uh, that kind of sparked my interest. Oh, rock dust and remineralizing the soil. And okay, that makes sense. And, and him to say like, hey, I grew all these tomatoes and I left all my tomatoes with late blight, which if anyone grows tomatoes, you'd be like, everybody was silent. Like, why would you ever do that? That's like bringing in a, a clone and not like checking it or dunking it or any, you're just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. We'll just, you know, throw all the disease in there. And uh, it blew people's minds and it got me thinking. Moved back to California, ran into really cool. There was a farm, um, farm to fork conference uh, in Grass Valley. And I just happened upon Elaine Ingham was there that year. And Joel Salatin was there that year. And Will Allen, who was doing some good stuff with worms and uh, really kind of, oh, okay, if we, we need to make better food, and here's some ways we can do it and kind of adding those things together. Oh, minerals, yeah, we need that. Or we're, we're lacking them now. Oh, we need microbes. That makes sense. That's how the soil works. Hey, we need both of those things. And eventually that led me to KNF, uh, Korean Natural Farming or Natural Farming. And um, partially because of the fermentation of things, because I had done a lot of pickling back here and learned from, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, New Englanders. Like we can things, we pickle things, we lacto ferment things, we do all this, and that really kind of set that course because I love, we'll just say, I love growing food, I love eating food, I love cooking food for people. Like food connects, like the more you like study culture and the world, you're like, oh, those people would have never had peppers of these, these cuisines that we think of. Oh, that's like a spicy food. Oh, Indian food, it's spicy because peppers. And you're like, oh, they're not even from there. Like they had to travel. And the interconnectedness and how food we all have to eat, we all enjoy eating most of the time. And like that connectedness is just something that really drives either my farming when it's 110 and it sucks to farm that day, or it's so smoky out, I gotta wear a respirator to you know, even go out, or I can't that day. Um, the idea that you know, I'm growing good food that's healthy for people that's going to go out to a chef that's going to make it amazing and people are going to be blown away and then maybe they'll trace that back and realize like hey i want to make better choices of what i eat not just for my health but like where it came from how it was grown the sustainability the regenerative nature of what you know what we're trying to do because we kind of messed up the whole system and sustainable is not really going to work anymore. We're kind of past that point. So like we got to, we got to reverse it a little bit. Um, yeah. So anyways, moved back to California, got in touch with some chefs. They actually came after me. I do a lot of uh, specialty chili peppers. Um, for those that are in KNF classes before they know about the hot sauce, uh, which I get stalked about. I brought some, so if things, go, if things go really wrong right now, I'll just start handing out hot sauce and you guys will be you know, <laughs> occupied and busy. So we'll get you awake too. So uh, yeah, so a cool coincidence of just meeting different people through farming in different areas of the country kind of brought me to that KNF through fermentation and remineralization remineral uh, of the soil and the microbes and kind of let's let them do the jobs. Um, yeah, that's where I got there. I'm actually gonna stop. We're gonna do it a little different than Ben. I love Ben, but he's like way more put together than I am. I'm, I'm a farmer. 
I'm actually a lazy farmer. We'll get into that as well and why you should be a lazy farmer too. Um, but uh, any questions about the history, where I'm going, where I've come from? If not, we'll keep going. I have one quick question. Yeah, Dave. Um, I've been telling the chefs for 35 years. Sometimes they want to talk about where the food came from and my farm, and that's fine. There was years when they were really big into that, and then it kind of goes, and now the farm's a fork moves. Have you uh, discussed k &F with them? And do the customers at any said restaurants possibly get to learn about k and processes in regenerative agriculture? Your food. A little bit, but that's something that definitely needs to be worked on. Like there needs to be, because they do in Sacramento, like a, a farm to fork festival. You never see a farmer there. You'll see the food and a sign where it came from locally, and you'll see the chef that did it into a fancy plate. But there, there's no representation of the farmer who actually did all the hard work, like for that thing. So there's definitely some work that needs to be done there. With the chefs I work with, they've been really like I wouldn't have worked with them if. We, it didn't work for both of us. Like, you can't undercharge me because I know I worked hard for this and I know it's worth it. Uh, and I can't overcharge you because you got to stay in business, otherwise I don't have business. And so there's a little bit of that. Uh, for special events, sometimes that happens. There's a little bit more farmer appreciation. And then people start thinking, or if it's like a hot sauce, like, oh, what is it? Why does this taste different? Well, it's fermented. Ew, what's fermented? And you're like, oh, no, this is great. You should love this here. And so that'll lead into some of those things. Um, I think people have that almost like a greenwashing of like, oh, well, they buy local, so you know, I eat there, but they have no idea about anything else. So yeah, it's a, there's a little bit starting in, I think, certain areas, but there's definitely that ebb and flow and what's popular at the time and how can I look like I'm doing the right thing, even though I have no idea about the farmer or the farm. And I give open invitations to anybody. I'm, hey, Chef, Chef Pato, if you want to tell anybody where your peppers came from for that mole sauce, Great, send them my way. Like, bring them out to the farm. They can taste whatever they want. They can taste all my inputs. Uh, bring your kids. I don't care what they get into. They're not going to get sick. They're not going to get poisoned by anything. I don't have any restrictions. I mean, go climb a tree. If you fall, that's on you. Um, well, that's a little bit on me, too, but I've got some liability for that. I got some insurance for that. But uh, yeah, I think a lot of that work with restaurants, like, it's j it was started as a kind of a headache back here when we sell to uh, chefs and stuff. So I was like, oh, well, we wanted the thing you brought last week. And you're like, well, why didn't you tell me that? Or, oh, this doesn't look that great. I don't want this this time. And I've run into like the complete opposite, getting back to Sacramento, and they're like searching for it, which is nice. But I think, yeah, there definitely needs to be more. Problem is farmers are so busy. <laughs> so there's no advocating for themselves to like, hey, we need this. How did you grow that? kind of thing. So yeah, it's a it's it's going right slowly, but it, yeah, it ebbs and flows. I definitely can see that. I brought cane up to a couple of my chefs and they were like, what? Yeah, yeah. Well I brought the hot sauce and they knew I was growing these weird peppers and he was like, I want to buy all of them. Don't sell them to anybody else. Like I want those and if you make this hot sauce some more, I want to buy that too. Like how did you make it? Why is it different? Oh well there's like a little intro. And then if the you know, customer is tasting it, like, why is this good? Why is this? So yeah, it's a little, yeah. Most of the time, if I'm like, KNF, and they're like, what are you talking about? Oh, I ferment everything. You, you want to eat my fertilizer? And like, <laughs> I had fish sitting in a bucket for a year. You want to taste it? It's fantastic kind of things. Yeah, so it's definitely, uh, there's a uh, keeping it simple for, for chefs and stuff until we get that more draw of like people wanting that. Um, yeah. Anything else? Anything else? Hey, hey, you. So, so, I, I've always been trying to, as a, some, as a proponent of your hot sauce, <laughs> multiple events in different states and still haven't got a bottle. We won't talk about that. All right, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I told you it's a sore subject. You, you fermented or you started pickling in New Hampshire when you were over here. Correct. So, I'm curious, like, what, I guess, the, the, the realm that that went into with K&F, did, did it change your fermentation? Like, you started pickles because you loved pickles? Or yeah. It was a little bit of both. I mean, it started more as a food thing okay. of the taste. Uh, like, I think cucumbers are dumb, and I think they all should be pickles. Like, I just, why eat a raw cucumber when you could eat a pickle? Like, it's just better. Especially like a spicy garlic pickle. I mean, cucumber, eh. 
save that for your like, you know, put it on your eyes or whatever. But yeah, so it definitely started the fermentation route was, uh, you know, starting to pickle like a traditional vinegar pickle out here for preserving through the winter. And then it was like, oh, what's this lacto ferment? We just a salt brine? Would that were, is that, are we gonna die from this? Like, I don't think we should eat this. And realizing like, oh, it's way safer than canning food. Like no one's gotten botulism from fermentation and it's been around thousands of years. So we've got a good track record on that. So it definitely started as a food and a cuisine thing and taste and realizing like, oh, someone pickled purslane and people are spraying Roundup on that. Like that's freaking delicious. I can pick that as a weed on my farm, pickle it or ferment it and then sell it to someone in a jar with a label and they're gonna pay me a bunch of money for my weeds like that I didn't take care of, I didn't water, I didn't plant them. I just let them do their thing and people were like, oh, this is fancy pickles. And I'm like, I like this. I like where this is going because hey, lazy farmer, I don't wanna do all the work. I'm gonna let, hey, let the weeds work for me. I'll sell those, I'll just pickle you and make eight bucks for a pint jar. Like that's easy. Um, so it did start in like a cuisine sense and the transition, like knowing that I think had more allure with natural farming. Like, oh, there's fermentation. Oh, there's other applications of these microbes that transform our food into cool things or preserve it for us. It can also help my crops. Like I can turn this thing back, like purslane. Yep, we pickle it, I sell it. Uh, I also turn it into FPJ and make it into a fertilizer for my farm. So it's like this great plant that I try to educate people like you shouldn't be pulling that or like spraying it like that's like gold for you. It's a great plant. Um, yeah, so that was a draw. And then I think I saw, oh, I don't remember the name of it, a little documentary kind of about natural farming and watching people like, yeah, this is my fertilizer, like, no problem. And oh, I got this thing. And you're like, I don't know if I'd try that, but eventually I did. Um, and so that kind of was the transition. It definitely started as, like I said, I love food, I love cooking, I love growing it. Plants fascinate me. So it was started there and kind of transitioned. And I was like, wait, I can do all that and farming, like all together, beautiful. Like, so that's kind of where it went to. Uh, so a point Ben, Ben was talking earlier and he was saying, you know, work smarter, not harder. Why, why wouldn't you use your IMOs and all these microbes that don't take a day off, that don't need a 401k, like labor is expensive. I basically run my farm. I get volunteers every once in a while. People get excited. They think farming's like this glorious thing and it is glorious, but it's also hard work. Um, I always offer a deal to like 20 year olds like, Hey, come work on the, f it's a free gym workout. You can get a tan, a workout, some good work ethic. And then they never come back again. Uh, that's usually how my volunteers go. I was like, I'd never want to transplant corn again. And they're like, Oh, that wasn't even a hard job. That was just, you've never bent over that long in your life. Um, yeah. So it was interesting to hear, hear Ben note on that because that was part of what I was like thinking like, okay. What do I have to give to these folks? Because, you know, I'm not a necessarily a cannabis person, so I'm not going to advise anybody on, on that. I know how to grow plants. I know how to grow veggies, and cannabis is a plant. It has its, you know, own things. Like my certain peppers have different requirements of me through the growing season than, say, popcorn or something that I'm growing. Um, but that idea of like, all right, what can I, what can I bring? Cause we could chit chat for hours. Just if I wasn't up here holding a mic, like we'd go for days, just talking about food and eating and farming and all that stuff up here. It's weird. Cause I'd rather just interact with everybody. But that idea that all that background that I kind of came through that got me to the natural farming side of things, um, was that idea of like, oh, the microbes is one part of it. Like that makes sense. That's how soil works. That's how forests work. No one takes care of the forest and it's been around. It only goes away when we mess it up. Um, like, great, I'm a lazy farmer. I want them to work for me. I don't wanna go do all this stuff and they do magical things. Like I don't even know how they're doing some of this stuff. So you guys do it. And that idea of remineralization, hey, giving them some stuff to work off of. Well, great, I can get that locally for free or from a quarry or wherever I source it from. If I can use something that was a waste product, they're going to ship somewhere and that's going to help my microbes as well. Like fantastic. Um, 
it's like purslane. Purslane is not a weed for me. Most of my weeds that people were like, oh, it's very weedy at your farm. And I'm like, no, it's free cover crop. Like, I've never been in a meadow and gone like, oh man, those plants are really getting outcompeted by those other plants they've lived next to forever. Like, no, they all get along and they work on each other. And there are allopathic weeds, but for the most part, like, I'm like, it's free cover crop. I don't have to seed it. I don't have to reseed it. I got to mow it down and, you know, keep it in check eventually when spring comes. But the idea of using nature's systems to work for you uh, is not only is it cool, like just a fun process to take part in, um, but to see it work and to see like my farm change, uh, dealing with you know some crazy weeds that are technically invasive. I'll call those weeds all day, uh, like Bermuda grass and stuff, just horrible death plants to try to deal with. And where I'm at. It doesn't get cold enough to kill it. It just kind of gets weak in the winter and just takes back off in the, in the heat of the summer. You give it water, it, it looks dead, and boom, it's back and just takes and just matting in the but applications of IMO4. So, talking about natural farming, um, you know, changing that fungal to bacterial balance of things and seeing the weeds not do well. Like, hey, bindweed, no one likes bindweed. Uh, but as the soil changed, it would get powdery mildew as it started climbing up my tomatoes or my peppers. And then it would die back because it got sick and died. And my plants, you know, oh no, it's gonna transfer. And, nope, they're healthy, they're fine. Also, I save a lot of seeds. So if I get a plant that's diseased or that thing's getting aphids, I don't wanna save that. I don't wanna intervene for that plant because I'm saving those genetics. So I'm as, almost as into genetics as most cannabis folks, just in a different realm of, you know, peppers and saving seeds and, and relocating crops to other areas like where I'm at and seeing, hey, can we get them adapted here? Can we actually grow those here? Can we spread you know, some food security to places that it might not work normally? Um, yeah, so it's a, it was a, a cool balance through all everything I've come through, uh, meeting you know, people in life and getting ideas and getting to natural farming and um, just seeing that idea of like the microbial levels and soil structure, the minerals, and how that even fits within natural farming of obviously microbes, because IMO is just like, IMO, 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 IMO. And then you've got your supplements, your minerals, you got your, all your other inputs, your calcium, calcium phosphate, potassium, seawater. Um, that's where you're adding those minerals. And then the idea that like, oh, those two coming together, trying to imitate that idea of a forest where no one takes care of it and it just goes and works. Um, was like a cool, cool thing to get to after, you know, 10 plus years doing it different ways. So when I worked on organic farms in New Hampshire, uh, organic, there were times where they're like, oh, we just sprayed that field, so you can't go in there for an hour. I'm like, but I thought it was organic. Like, well, yeah, it is, but when it's wet, you can't walk in there. And I'm like, this is a stupid system. This is dumb. And that's when you realize, as an organic farmer, this organic farming thing is kind of bubkiss, like, and then it went to like sustainable. Oh, we're beyond organic. Oh, now we're nowhere sustainable. And you're like, these are all getting taken by corporations and stuff and just getting greenwashed. And you're like, no, 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 no. Okay, we got a regenerative. And they're like, oh, now everybody's hopping on that now. And you're like, well, if you're not gonna do it, don't, don't say you are, but oh, I get off on rants with that stuff. It's, I'm mostly a farmer, but I like, uh, yeah, chatting about those things. Um, I might actually pass these out now and get them rotating. I won't keep people waiting. Um, just quick, if there's any questions on things or I say, uh, I'll get, I'll get right to you guys. Um, one thing I was just thinking of, like, I know Wendy will probably hit on it. Uh, cause she kind of came, we were like that flip flop yin yang of, you know, me starting in veggies and adding some cannabis and juvenile cannabis and adding some veggies. Like, don't be afraid to explore uh, food crops as cover crops. There's definitely crops that aren't gonna compete for light. They're gonna stay low. They don't have crazy roots all over the place. And like uh, double bonus, you've got food either for yourself or that's another income point um, just to help. Plus, I mean, how cool is it to have those two plants together? Cause I think, uh, uh, I lost them. Patrick, Soil King was saying the other night, like, hey, there's no hierarchy of farming. Like, it's not like if you're a cannabis farmer, oh, you're, you're more special and you can't possibly do food. Or if you're a food farmer, like, oh, that's just like normal farming. Or, oh, you're a rancher. Like, 
all those things can work together, and it's amazing when they do. Um, anyways, yes, question, sorry. I do have some animals on the farm. Um, like I said, lazy farmer. I like uh, getting to the beach on the weekend. I can do that with plants. I can set my water timer, take my wife to the beach, and then come back. I've worked with animals before. I know I can't leave for those things, and I've got to find someone to take care of it for me. We do have some chickens on the farm. They're not necessarily quote unquote part of everything, but they definitely get used. All their bedding and litter gets scraped out. I put a little IMO in there. I put it in a pile because, hey, I don't like turning it, and it's chicken shit. Like, uh, they do it for me. They love messing up piles. So I put it in a wheelbarrow. They do all my work for me. In a couple weeks, I can pick that up and go, smells like forest soil. Like, this is fantastic. I didn't really do anything. I fed the chickens. I made sure they were OK. And then I gave them something fun to do. So we don't, we don't, uh, I don't integrate too many animals on the farm as part of my farming system. Um, we definitely utilize some other people in the area and other farmers and ranchers um, just trying to keep things local. And they're like, we've got all this waste. Do you, you want it? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I'll come pick that up and turn it into soil and I'll probably sell you my vegetables. So like, this is great. You're just, I'm getting it for free and then you're paying me in the, in the end. So yeah, and then uh, back. I don't know. This will be, we've been on the property for six years, and this season will be the fifth. I believe it'll be the fifth full season, uh, like natural farming. And it's almost exclusively like, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's still work to do on the farm, for sure. I mean, it's a process, and it's, you know, I chose to do it as my career. Like, I've got to love it still. If you don't love it, you, you know, you burn out, and you're like, F everything. Um, no, there's definitely, I mean, with that weed suppression and seeing that, like, I don't have to worry about that anymore. That's great, when normally it's like, ah, oh, crap. Knee-jerk reaction, like, what can I buy to spray on that? Because I don't want that here anymore. And now I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, whatever. I mean, maybe I'll cut it down and I'll turn it into a fertilizer later. Like, whatever. So yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of changes, like, in our weed pressure. I've seen changes in our pest pressure. I was going to say, I also do Jadam, but I mostly do it just to learn it so I can teach it. And that's a little, there's some great benefits in that. And it's kind of a basically father-son of natural farming there. Um, in Jadam, but I, I basically only would make all those inputs so that I knew how to do it. Because really, I love farming, I love cooking food and eating food, like I've said a hundred times. Uh, but I also love like, helping people. Like Whether it's you guys in this room, like you guys can hit me up whenever. If you want to add vegetables to what you're growing, hit me up, let's, let's do it. If you're like, hey, I got this chef that was asking about something. Oh yeah, I got a recommendation for a vegetable. It's gonna be super easy for you to grow, and they're gonna pay top dollar for it, so why not add it? Um, oh shoot, I totally lost my train of thought there. Anyways, yeah, so weed pressure, pest pressure, oh, Jadam, that's what I was saying. I don't use a lot of the, the wetting agents or the, the sulfur, wettable sulfur from Jadam or the JHS, like making a pesticide with um, like a, de a decoction of, of herbal ingredients of like, hey, this plant never has pests, like let's use whatever's in that, concentrate it and use it on the spider mites. Let's let's hit them with a wetting agent and these things, and like let's take them out. But that's just going to break down into the soil later and be awesome for everything. I don't use a lot of it after five years of of doing natural farming. I just don't have much pest pressure anymore. Like there are certain crops we have an invasive pest in California, especially with brassicas. So I just don't do them anymore because um, I went to a conventional ag, and they were like, "Well, we've tried all these horrible poisons that you need to like." suit up for and never go in your field again and we've been combining them and you're using horrible crap how about just grow things better and then they don't come eat your stuff so we kind of did away with brassicas just to not have to deal with that because they would always always amazes me insects can find their food source like so well but you stick us in a forest and we'd be like 
well, I guess I'm gonna die in three days. Like these pine needles, these pine needles are not good anymore. Like I don't know how to find food miles and miles away. So yeah, the pest pressure has gone down, the weed pressure has gone down. I do less work and whatever extra work I might be doing to get my preparations and stuff, it's fun. It's exciting to do. It's exciting to experience and observe and be a part of it. Um, much more than other farmers I ever worked for. That it was like, it's a job, it's a thing I do, and then I go home and I just leave it. And I'm like, no, you need to be out. Like, if you don't love it, like, why would you do it? If no one, if you didn't love cannabis, like, why would you grow it? Like, money, I guess. But like, in the end, money's not gonna make us all happy. Um, it's doing the things we actually really love to do. Um, which for me is natural farming and fermenting and eating. Um, okay, I got those two, okay, yeah. Oh dear, you get that's the problem. You get me talking about food and veggies. What's that? Purslane. Yeah, purslane. Stays low, has one tap root. <laughs> It'll reseed like no problem. Chickweed, edible. Put that in a salad mix, sell it for twelve dollars a pound. Which I'm pretty sure you do, right, Dave? I do. Yeah. yeah Sixteen dollars a pound. Sixteen, see there you go. Look at that. Things that people think are weeds that are spraying all the time. So chickweed, purslane, things that stay low that if you want them to recede, they'll totally do it. And you don't have to do any more work for that. And if you get into natural farming, then you're using that as fertilizer and food for your plants. Um, more like traditional food crops where it's not like eating the weeds, um, you know, doing stuff for aeration, like some uh, radishes, super quick. That's one of my go-tos. If someone's like, I got this kid and he wants to like grow something, but I don't, I have a brown thumb. I don't know what to do. Like, Buy some radishes. The kid might not like the radishes, but like at least you can get them going towards you know, something tasty and it's gonna aerate your soil a little bit and you get food in like 30 days. Um, so even if you went through it and go, ah, I didn't really like that. Hey, that was a month. I can put something else in there now. Um, some of those, some root crops uh, work well. I mean, obviously not all of them, um, but a lot of the root crops stay lower in height and so they're not competing um, with cannabis for, you know, light energy and photons. Um, I'm trying to think what other good ones there are that I would put in. I mean, I know folks that are doing peppers and you know, they don't, you know, peppers generally don't get super, super tall, especially in a short season. Um, and it's great. You can then use those peppers as a, a, a pesticide later. Do you make with, yeah, your rye? Do I? No, you, can. <laughs> you can, yeah. And if your rye goes bad, you can make other things with it too. You mold on there. Um, oh, see, I got talking about food and then. Oh my What's that? Yo, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. A bonus with those, if you can keep around long enough, if you're doing a continual cycle and reusing your soil and using something that's a, a biennial where the second year it's going to flower, those in that umbellifer family, so fancy vegetable talk, uh, carrots, parsnips, things like that. Things that can overwinter too. Uh, their flowers are a multi, tons of little tiny flowers, which bring in so many more pollinators because it's a nectar and a pollen plant. And so lacewings love that type of flower. So that keeps them happy. Um, there's a lot of those. It's interesting to see different flower types and what insects, especially beneficials, like different types. And even aiming some of your you know, possible food crop cover crops into that with that beneficial insect thing you just go like wait uh, how this is not what you learn in farming school that like it's this easy you just got to think about things and go out in nature and look at what they're doing and implement that where you're at um yeah oh i put a little note here i was, I was like man we really effed up the planet and if we could do that we can uneff it it's gonna take some time and it's going to take some like-minded folks that are in the room and stuff and getting those connections going and educating people. Uh, I think it can be done. It might not happen while I'm alive, but if we get that ball rolling, I think we can really, you know, make a difference. And that's why it was important for me to come out um, when they asked me to come. was well, like, yeah, I, I, I'm behind this 100%. Like, it's what I do. It's how I make my money. And my wife's a teacher. I'm a farmer. We don't make a ton of money, but we both love what we do. And that's, hey, that's what we need. That's all. Yeah. Uh, to what degree do you till your soil? Like none. I mean, 
I wouldn't say I'm no-till. I definitely had to break ground on that land when I first got there. It had nothing growing on it for years except for whatever popped up. And so that initial tillage just to like, all right, let's get this started. Uh, natural farming has like a little protocol for like getting that starting and getting a good soil treatment to, to start working your, your ground in that direction, um, which was hard coming from like a conventional, even though organic, like we tilled all the time in New Hampshire, like regardless of the box that would break all the tines on the rototiller on the back of the tractor, like they would do it all the time. And I'm like, we just keep having these same problems. Like we're obviously we're doing something wrong here. It's not working. So initial tilling, yeah, no problem. Like sometimes you gotta, you gotta, all the meadows in New England probably weren't meadows until everybody cut down the trees. And then it was like, oh, different ecosystem. We had to, we impact our environment definitely. And it needs to be done sometimes. But as I'm like progressing into that, it's like, oh, I, see, I can shove my hand in my soil now. Like I've got a lot of clay in my soil, which is great for where I'm at as far as water retention where I'm super dry, everything's drying out. There's points where I can't water enough, the plant still looks sad. And you're like, I'm sorry, it's 110 and there's smoke. And like, it doesn't matter how much water I put on you, like it's just a hard time. Um, but I've seen that, that friability in the soil, just being able to shove my hand in and like pulling weeds, if I ever do pull weeds, it's like, oh, that was, that was easy. And then I look at the weeds and I'm like, oh, there was some fungi attacking the roots there or working with them. I don't, don't work with them. But, but seeing that even in super dry conditions in the middle of summer, getting a new plot ready and just kind of breaking ground a little bit or forming beds, you know, a little, you know, not tillage, but disturbance and seeing all that mycelium in the soil still and like nothing was even here. It never got watered. It's super dry, but there's still life happening there. Like there's these strong microbes that, yeah, I collected them from this weird place that I thought, yeah, that's really dry there. Maybe I'll bring those guys back to the farm. Maybe we can help with, you know, our water issues in California. So yeah, initial tillage. Yeah, of course we gotta, I mean, it's really hard to make a, it's, a, it's fantastic, the no-till permaculture. And I love all of these things. I also have to make money. Otherwise I'm just like playing in the soil and not, you know, wasting all my wife's money that she made. <laughs> We're like, that doesn't work. So yeah, that idea of, I love all those, you know, back to nature, back to like all these ideas, like they're great. They all fit together and it's definitely, they can be piecemealed together. They can go one-on-one, -on -one, but me as this is my job, I'm a farmer, I have to make money. Otherwise, yeah, it's just a expensive hobby where I get some food, but, um, yeah, but so far, I mean, we haven't done, yeah, it's been five years. So besides, you know, bed shaping or anything like that, it's tough though in the vegetable because you've got, you know, a greenhouse, oh, plastic, poly, <laughs> oh, my drip tape to, you know, be efficient in watering my plants so I'm not wasting the water I have access to. I have to buy plastic, like that sucks. And there currently is no other option for that. So I've got to focus, I mean, when I tell people, oh, they want to start a garden. What can I grow? What should I do? I want to do all these things. I want to grow like these 20 different vegetables. You're like, no, 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 just do three. What's your favorite things to eat? Do three. Because if you start too strong, like you're going to get overwhelmed. So the idea of like, even this weekend, you're going to get a lot of information about regenerative and being sustainable and all these things like, yeah, pick and choose if you need to, because it can be overwhelming. Whereas I would love to get rid of all the plastic on my farm, but currently I don't have the option for that. So I have to focus my attention on what can I do positively for my farm that's going to have an impact on my farm on my crops on my paycheck on the community around me how they're educated uh and my impact i mean globally um you know i'm not you know oh i won't i was gonna go a little banana talk there but uh, we'll leave that yeah 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 perfect all right so we're uh, we got about five minutes left any other questions i and again i'm around pretty much the whole weekend, please feel free to come up. I'll try to be out and available for people. And then uh, I think it's in the thing, a cellar door collective is my farm because we kind of started doing like so many different things, tinctures and, and uh, bitters, herbal bitters and fermented hot sauces and pickles and fresh veggies. So it didn't make sense to be like, oh, we're just a farm. Like, no, we do so many other things. So cellar door collective is the Instagram page if you want to follow that. Um, you can hit me up on that. You can find me on Facebook. 
Um, I am a farmer, I am a husband, and I am a father. So I do have other things in my life that I have to do, but I try to get back to everybody as, as quick as I can. What? Well, they're not quite helping yet on the farm. Uh, my older one eats too many tomatoes. He doesn't help harvest that well. Do you have any hot sauce for sale? Oh my word, I already have a wait list from the last KNF class of hot sauce. Because, yeah, Chris started that. Um, no, I will, probably at lunch, I'll set these out. Um, I might keep, there's little eyedroppers so we don't like pour through it. Uh, but we'll definitely put them out for lunch. You guys can add them to stuff. You can taste it. Put a little drop on your, on your hand. Taste it. It's not crazy, crazy hot. I used a little bit different peppers. So that's the other thing. People go, oh, I liked that hot sauce three years ago. I'm like, yeah, great. Well, their different peppers did better this year. And so that's what went into the hot sauce. I'm not here to mess with that. Like, I'm here to ferment it and make it funky and tasty. So yeah, this is a long fermentation, longer than most people do, because I like that funkiness. This is probably, ooh. I like that funk, yeah. Um, these are currently, see I started them two months before the last KNF class. It's like, they're going on six, six, seven months currently. I mean, I'll let some go a year and just like, especially if they're not getting funky on top where I'm like, eh, if I'm not gonna eat it, like I'm not gonna be willing to sell that to anybody. Um, I just saw another hand, yeah, oh, it was Quinn. Like peppers is not a particularly expensive crop, and because you do a lot of post-processing and create a fermented product, you're now getting like, you know, dollar on the penny uh, kind of situation. Um, I think that's what a lot of people need to do with small farms to be successful. Could you like talk about how you came to that, or like did you start doing that right away? Or, like, yeah, like, that's. You see success I mean, that? yeah, that was totally like necessity and invention and getting creative like hey if I'm not gonna take out these loans I gotta figure out something I can do myself to make my product more expensive or more desirable or add some value to it um, so that was definitely early early I mean I used to do like a salad mix and it was like oh it's super like pretty easy salad grows fast and then you cut it and you wash it and then you put it in a box and people pay a lot of money for it per pound <laughs> and are amazed when it stays fresh like for so long and you're like well yeah because it was picked yesterday it didn't get shipped from somewhere else or uh, another piece of land i leased um, prior to this one the lady said oh i don't i gave him some carrots as that was part of the land lease i get land and water for a share of veggies and i'm like this is fantastic especially for california uh said so she didn't like carrots well she never had like a real carrot from the ground and i was like just taste them I like carrots now, like, she was at least in her 60s, like, oh wow, you hadn't had a real carrot, like that's sad, that's sad for people, and there's kids now that are like, they don't know, we had kids come to the farm, a little off topic, but it's you know, a little rant for me, uh, and they not know what vegetables look like, like no one could name any vegetable that we walked them around to until they saw a tomato on a plant, and they were like, oh, that's a tomato, that's a tomato, and you're like, wow, good job, it's literally right there. <laughs> Don't know that a carrot grows underground. Doesn't know, like, that's amazing the disconnect that people have with food. Um, so yeah, doing the value added was definitely a necessity uh, for someone being a small farm and like margins are small, I'm not taking out loans. I would say it definitely started in, in New England. Like that, you know, hey, winters are hard sometimes and we've carried that over from past times when we didn't have fermentation and learning that, or refrigeration. So learning the fermentation side of things to, hey, it tastes better, it lasts longer, why not? And especially in California where people are like, I don't know fermentation at all. Like, then they love it, they get all excited about it. So yeah, last question. <laughs> last question. Uh, you mentioned consuming some of your KNF inputs. Like, I have tasted every KNF input I have ever made, including IMO and liquid IMO. Okay. <laughs> WSK, like potassium inputs, calcium inputs, that was one thing I was like, well, if I can do it, I don't want to be someone that comes up and says, you can eat everything you, you make in natural farming, and if I haven't tasted it, same way with Jadam, like, I want to know how to make it so I can help other people, even though I don't use it a lot, I don't have the need. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's fermented, fermented foods are really good for our gut biome. Exactly. How would an FPJ compare to, say, a kimchi or a kombucha in terms of? 
uh, different, but then we also have our little like collection of lactobacillus. So like I don't buy, you know, oh, probiotics for my gut. I collect them from my area in the air. It's like magic. And then I separate them out and I've got this for my plants. I've got this for me. I go out and eat too much like heavy, greasy food. I come home and I'm like, oh, it's lab time. Got to get that lactobacillus down there. And 10 minutes later, I'm like, oh, I don't feel completely crazy full anymore. So that was my question. Can we use canine sort of like kimchi and kombucha to benefit ourselves? Yeah, for sure. There's some, I won't get into it because we're running behind and now I'm peeing all over the floor. Uh, <laughs> the, um, oh shoot, now I just, lab, and then we were talking about, totally slipped my mind. Pretty much answered it. Yeah, using it for yourself, the kimchi. Yeah, so it, a lot of that kimchi is your lactobacillus strains. Okay. And those are your fermentation. It's that same idea of fermentation that we're doing, we're just looking for just the lactobacillus and that input rather than the food. But I use lab if I want to kickstart a ferment, especially with peppers that are a low acid, where you really need to like get that pH down, I'll add lab to it that I've collected. It's my own local lab. It's like my buddy's helping me out. I'll add it to kickstart a ferment. So I'm not getting any surface mold or anything if that would happen. So anyways, yeah, you guys got more questions? Feel free to hit me up anytime and we'll, uh, we'll talk food. I'll feed you food, come to the farm, we'll cook stuff, yeah. Anyways, guys, thanks for your time. I also brought some pepper seeds as well that are nice, uh, uh, spicy. They're in some of this, but.